Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my uh, my home office um, <laughs> in these pandemic times. Um, it's my birthday today, so thank you for everyone who congratulated me. I keep forgetting it's my birthday, uh, and then someone will uh, congratulate me, and I'll be like, oh, it's my birthday today. Um, so uh, today... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what I've been doing this year. So the thing is that I tweeted uh, back in February, uh, on February 23rd. I said, I know it's crazy, but I want to make a browser. Um, so the, th the truth of the matter is I've been wanting to make a browser for pretty much all of my career. Um, and I started... Uh, while I was at university, and I uh, I applied for Opera Software to go make the Opera browser, and that was my first real job. Um, but the thing is, to make a browser, you really need a budget. You need lots of people, you need lots of things, and I have not that kind of money, at least not for this. I mean, how are you going to get a budget or get anyone to pay you to make something that you're going to give away for free? It's it's a difficult proposition. Uh, and really, like, how what does it take? Like, you have a lot of people to do the development, and you need people to do maintenance, and you also need uh, hosting and all sorts of technology for doing all of these things. And all of these things cost money. Um, so... Wanting to make a browser is not enough. You kind of have to make a sort of a plan. Uh, and anyway, what is the browser business model anyway? Uh, you know, you have a product, you give it away for free for everyone. Like, how would this ever make sense financially? Um, and the truth of the matter is that Google pays for it. And Google has been paying for browsers uh, for, for a long time. Uh, way before they made Chrome, they were paying for browsers. And so we might feel that uh, however we feel about Google, but the fact of the matter is that Google is paying for most browsers in the world today. Uh, and they do that through uh, through search deals, so so Google search deals. Uh, and there are, there are other uh, also partners in this, but Google is by far the biggest one. Um, and they pay maybe, if you're lucky, around a dollar per user per year. And then you think like, okay, so a dollar per user is not a lot of money. But the thing is, browsers have a lot of users. Like, if you have a really, really unpopular browser, you might have like a 0.1% of the browser market. But 0.1% of the browser market is still millions of users. <laughs> so the idea is that even if you are quite of a niche browser, you could still be able to support uh, a few developers at least. Um, but the thing is, I don't have any deal with Google uh, because, you know, Google's only interested if you have users and I have no users. Uh, so there's not really a bootstrapping process for this. You kind of have to have a browser first and then you have to have users for that browser and then you can maybe talk to Google and they might talk to you back. Uh, so this doesn't really um, work. Uh, so we need something else because we have zero budget. So I want to make a browser, but I have no money. Uh, I want to make a browser, but I'm just one dev. <laughs> I want to make a browser, so I need help. And the help is going to come in the form of open source. Uh, so, so basically, there is more of a stunt than a plan. But the idea is, how can I wield all sorts of open source projects that exist today in 2020 that didn't exist in, in 2005 uh, to make a browser? And I did make browsers uh, before. And one of the things that I realized throughout this process uh, that I'm going to talk about today uh, is that a lot of, of the things that were uh, that we had to make custom in 2005, uh, we don't have to make custom today. There are really good open source projects, often much better than, than what we had back in the day to do these things. So... Uh, the picture here, it says, uh, sorry about the street art, but my pony lesson got canceled. Um, because the upside to this whole proposition is that it's 2020. I'm not sure that is an upside, but it's kind of an upside. 
uh, suddenly we like the world changed. Uh, there's, I suddenly got a lot of free time, but at the same time, it's 2020, and a lot has happened over the past 15 years to make many of these things easier. So the talk is called Trying to Build an Open Source Browser in 2020. Um, and let's go. So first, a little introduction of me. Uh, my name is Patricia Oles. I'm a, a trainer and a consultant. Uh, I'm a C++ programmer. I've been working uh, in the past few years in like the area of application security, um, secure coding in C++ and things like that. I do trainings. Please hire me. Uh, I can do them remote. <laughs> Uh, I, I work currently for the last uh, a couple of years for, for a company that I co-founded, which is called TurtleSec. Uh, before that, though, I worked at, at uh, several different companies, and we'll get back to that. Uh, I have a master's computer, uh, in computer science, and my pronouns are she, her. So the thing is, my first actual real job out, out of university was at Opera Software, working on the original Opera browser. Uh, as specifically, I was uh, the first li first full-time Linux uh, developer, uh, uh, Linux slash Unix, we called it at the time. Uh, and it was a great experience. We had a lot of fun making that browser. Um, then later, I worked at Cisco. And at Cisco, I was, uh, I was also working on, on browser technology, but I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> because I was under NDAs and none of my work had actually been released. And it took a while, actually, after I left uh, Cisco, about two years uh, before the stuff that I worked on uh, at Cisco was released, uh, because we were, uh, we were making embedded telepresence products, and I was uh, working on a platform for having uh, uh, web applications integrate into this uh, platform, uh, which is now uh, parts of that work has been released um, and, and is currently running in Cisco Telepresence products. And uh, then I, I, when I left Cisco, I, want, uh, I wanted to make a browser again. Uh, so I went to Vivaldi and I worked at Vivaldi uh, making the Vivaldi browser. Uh, and I did that up until I started TurtleSec, where I just kind of accidentally, sort of on purpose, sort of because I can't help myself, uh, tried to make a browser again. Um, so, <laughs> Apparently, I have a theme for browsers, uh, and I do, I do. But why? Like, why would anybody want to make a browser? And the thing is, technically, it's really challenging. It has so many things inside of it, and it is also something that I use myself. So it, no matter what you're interested in when it comes to computers or, or, or a programming, you will find it in a browser. Uh, there, they are so full packed of features. If you're interested in compilers, there are compilers in browsers. If you're interested in networking, there are networking in browsers. If you're interested in a UI, there are stuff in browsers. If you're interested in uh, practically anything you're interested in, there will be something in it in browsers. And having a product and uh, working on a product that you actually use yourself is a privilege uh, that we don't often have. So. I, I like the fact I like to have lots of users. Uh, I don't usually have that privilege when I make something. And here, I, one of the things that I said when I uh, started working uh, at Vivaldi is that I wanted to work someplace where people could yell at me on the internet. And, <laughs> and that is a privilege to be able to have uh, contact with your users and something that I really appreciate. I believe in the web and I believe that it has been one of those crazy plans that actually let us do. Like if we have ever planned the internet, like planned the web saying, you know, that anybody could publish anything wherever they were and other people could read it. I mean, nobody would actually have allowed that if it was planned in a meeting, but they let us do this because, you know, nobody was paying attention. So looking at browsers. Uh, outside of Firefox, uh, the landscape for browsers is quite interesting. Um, and, and we're going to have a little bit of a look at that. So if we go back in the day, uh, KDE made a project, uh, KHTML, uh, where, which was the engine that uh, Conqueror used uh, for the Conqueror browser for KDE. 
uh, later on, uh, when Apple decided they wanted to make a browser, uh, they went around looking at what existed already in browser engines and, and decided that they liked this thing that uh, KDE had made and, and basically forked it. Uh, spent about a year uh, uh, porting it to, to, uh, to Mac OS and then, and then made Safari. Uh, they ended up releasing this in a semi-functional uh, open source project, project and called it uh, WebKit. Uh, and that was the, the web view itself. And then it was wrapped in this project called Chromium, which was, um, which was the open source project. And so uh, a few years went by and then Google decided we want to make a browser too. <laughs> And so they also went looking around what existed already and decided to use uh, WebKit as the basis of their browser as well. And for a while, uh, Google and and, uh, and Apple went along in this little song and dance uh, until Google was feeling like the whole project was kind of hard uh, to manage and they were doing most of the work anyway. Uh, so Google decided to, uh, to fork it. Uh, so they forked the whole project. Uh, they called this new version uh, Chromium Blink. And in Chromium Blink, uh, we've seen uh, a different kind of model where a lot of projects have converged to this. Uh, so the first, uh, one of the first uh, here is Opera. So Opera left its own engine uh, and decided to use uh, Chromium Blink. Um, uh, Vivaldi also was started uh, from this and other types of browsers as well, like uh, Brave, for example, also use Chromium Blink as their, as their engine for their browsers. Uh, and uh, recently, Edge also uh, abandoned their own engine and went over to Chromium uh, Blink. So this is a whole family of browsers mostly based on the same open source project, uh, mostly managed by Google. Uh, for for a web view. So when you think about a browser, you have the, the web view and then you have uh, stuff around and other types of features. And those things are basically what will make a browser a browser as opposed to another one. Um, anyway, so this has been kind of lingering in the back of my mind. And uh, so for a talk that I did in, in, uh, in 2018, I made a browser, <laughs> just a toy browser, just as a demonstration of something in my talk. Uh, and this is a talk called Isolating GPU Access in its own process, and it's on YouTube, and you can go see it. It was, I, I did it about uh, two years ago. And this was basically about the architecture inside of Chromium and how it works uh, with access to the GPU. And it's a lot about composition and these things. Um, but I actually just ended up doing a demo of this on stage. Uh, uh, so this is a slide from that talk. I might have decided to have a demo last night. Um, and then I kind of just left it there because, you know, uh, I got busy. So I, I made like a, like a small toy browser, but I got busy. I had things to do. I had made a company. Uh, and we, we got customers. We had to have paying work, all these things, life, right? Uh, so I was doing like come 2020, I was doing on-prem international trainings, mostly in secure programming in C++. And I was doing it in, you know, in, uh, in the Netherlands, in, in Germany. Um, and I'm in Norway, right? Uh, so come March, 2020, all of everything I had got canceled, uh, of course. Uh, so, <laughs> so suddenly I have some time, some uh, free time. To see. Um, so maybe I should have a look at this whole thing again. So I forked whatever I was, uh, the, my toy browser, and I um, bought a domain name, uh, which is uh, excellent. Uh, you can go there. It says hello world, <laughs> turtlebrowser.com. Um, and the idea is basically like this. So 
so there's there's this uh, there's this saying in computer uh, well in programming that the last ten percent of functionality is ninety percent of the time. So whenever somebody says that you know we're ninety percent done, then you know that you know ninety percent of the time is left for everything that is like polishing, bug fixing. Oh no, we didn't actually want it that way after all. All of those things, right? All of the the things that make things finish take a lot of time. So, but but the converse of this is what I'm trying to exploit in this case. So, if the the last ten percent of functionality is ninety percent of the time, then the first ninety percent should be ten percent of the time. The first ninety percent of functionality should be ten percent of the time, maybe. So, <laughs> the idea here is how little can you do and still get something up and running. So this becomes a very uh, shallow process where on each, uh, each critical section of a feature or a functionality, you will get like the basics down. Uh, and you will do that across the board until you get something that is basically running. Uh, you have to any. You don't have time to to go in depth on anything. So bring up uh, becomes really important. You have to do it really fast on each one of these because you're one person. You got no money, and you have limited amount of time. Um. So any kind of in depth thing, we just don't have time for. We have to kind of jump between all of these in like a round robin fashion until you have something that works. Okay. So first of all we need to think like what kind of uh, GUI framework do we want and how do we want to handle porting. Now, now we're going to be using Chromium Blink. That is because that is uh, what everybody else <laughs> uses basically. And, uh, but we also need to think about how do we want to make the UI. There is a UI framework inside of Chromium Blink and it is used for many browsers. Uh, not for Vivaldi. Vivaldi uses uh, WebTech for its uh, UI, uh, but but many browsers use uh, the the UI toolkit inside of Chromium. Uh, I'm not a big fan, so so I'm uh, I'm going to go for when it comes to UI. My my favorite is QML, but also we need a porting layer because we want to to run this on many different platforms. So we're going to go with Qt, uh, but Qt will give us several advantages. We want the initial platforms, the typical desktop platforms, to be Linux, uh, Mac OS, and Windows. Uh, but over time, we also want to go to mobile too. So I haven't gotten that far yet, uh, but I do have uh, things running on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Uh, so the idea here is to use Qt uh, for C++, or for like the C++ parts of Qt, and also QML for uh, UI. So the C++ is mostly for business logic, and then the QML is for the UI. So for those of you who are not familiar uh, with QML, uh, I'm just going to show you because this is one of the big features of Qt, in my uh, opinion. <clears throat> so it's sort of like if JSON, JavaScript, and CSS had a baby. Uh, so it looks uh, sort of like this. So this is uh, this is a QML component. So you can see it has like it's called webpage.qml. So this is what's going to be, if you can imagine, to be our our, our web view, the the things that we're, where we're going to show the internet in our application. Um, and uh, we're going to have two uh, things here. We're going to have an address bar that is going to display the page that you're on. Or and also function as an input field for going to some other place. Um, so this is a simplified version from Turtle Browser, uh, where you have uh, the address bar here uh, and and the web engine. But if we go from the top, so we you have import statements uh, where you can import the, the the QML modules that you're using. You can also import like uh, JavaScript files in here. Then we have like this column layout where we uh, on top have like this address bar. Uh, and this is a custom component. So we have a component uh, in our project, which is called address bar, which it has like back forward reload and like the input field. Uh, and then we have the web engine view, which is like the web page. Now the web engine view is from Qt web engine and it is something that is uh, comes with Qt. 
and we'll look at more of that later. But that's basically what it looks like. So the advantage of QML is that it's easy to change the UI. And this is something that I've seen over and over in projects is that once you get a UI up, it's often really, really hard to change. Uh, and one of the things that I've seen uh, with a QML web uh, uh, or a QML definition of a UI is that it is really easy to change. And uh, that I find to be a big advantage. So the desktop uh, web view, what, how do we want to see the internet? We've kind of already looked at it, but we really want to have Chromium Blink. And so we're going to be using here a uh, cute web engine, but that has some issues and uh, we will get back to why that might get a bit complicated. So uh, before we go into the components, uh, I just want to show you, okay. So this is the browser. Um, it's not like it's not it's not anything special. It has like uh, tabs. Oh, let's see. I have to have the mouse on the right screen. Um, it has uh, tabs. Uh, you know, it has. Uh, you can play like YouTube videos, um, things like that. It doesn't really have a lot of features, but you can have like you can open tabs. And you know they get smaller. Uh, you can close tabs. So I have some uh, some shortcuts. So this is like Control W to close tabs. Um, but it's you know it's very basic. It doesn't have much. It does have this specific uh, layout here, which you can see that the tabs are all the way on top, where you have like your minimize, your maximize, and your close button all in one. So this is like the typical. Uh, browser uh, layout or the way that you organize the windows. Uh, so, so this is um, this is Turtle Browser. It's not very pretty, um, but uh, it has the basic functionality, right? Okay. So let's see. Go back here. Okay. So. One of the things that we had in at Opera, we had to have custom uh, build uh, systems for each platform uh, because we're making native uh, native applications, right? Uh, but in 2020, we don't have to do that anymore. And so we are going to use CMake as our kind of meta build system uh, to generate uh, uh, build files for all of our different platforms. And this works really well on desktop. Uh, with Qt, uh, you can easily make uh, make builds for, for all of the desktop platforms. It might be a little bit more complicated for mobile, but we're going to go, like, I haven't gotten that far, but we're going to go try to do that for, for Android and iOS as well. Uh, but it will probably be easier for Qt 6, where they're going all in on CMake. Uh, so if you haven't seen CMake, although I, I assume you all have, um, CMake is 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 okay. I, I you know people have like a love hate relationship with CMake. Um, I'm not like a super expert at at CMake stuff, uh, but I do my best. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm also reading the professional CMake book, so hopefully I'll get better. And um, for dependency management uh, is also an issue here. Uh, we need to pull in Qt uh, uh, with all of its um, uh, all of the components that we need, including the the Cube Web Engine. So, we're going to be using Conan. Now, I could have probably used something else, but I really, uh, I I currently really like Conan, and it also has uh, an excellent Conan Cute uh, uh, dependency or package that you can use. So, Conan Cute is uh, maintained uh, by Eric. Le Mancier, I hope it's correct. My French is horrible. Um, and he's really nice. <laughs> and he's been taking all of my bug reports on Twitter DM, which is like a huge feature uh, because I'm shy. Um, and in in Con and Qt, you can configure which Qt modules you want to use. So if we go and look here, so you basically here, uh, you uh, say, OK, I want. Uh, Cute. So this is Qt 15. Um, and then you can say up here which kind of modules that you want to turn on. Um, 
And that is, uh, is a big deal because the, the, the default uh, Qt module that is pre-built and everything that you will get if you don't uh, tweak the, the options doesn't have, uh, doesn't have the web view and it doesn't have a lot of things. It's quite of a stripped down kind of Qt, but you can actually configure it to be uh, full-fledged Qt. Um, so I do have a bunch of modules that I turn on, including, of course, here, uh, the Qt web engine. Uh, but this also means that it's not pre-built, uh, which means uh, we have to build it ourselves. Uh, and we'll get back to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so for our CI CD, I have gone all in on GitHub Actions. And the reason for that was basically because the project was already on GitHub and because I wanted to learn GitHub Actions. Um, but I, one of the things that I realized after a little bit was that GitHub Actions has two killer features uh, for this particular scenario. First of all, they have Mac build servers. Uh, and I don't have a Mac. Like I have a dual boot Linux and Windows machine. So I can do Linux and Windows builds locally, but I, but I don't have a Mac. And, and you have to build Macs uh, or you have to build on Mac hardware. It's, a, it's an Apple thing. Uh, and they have uh, Apple hardware. Um, at GitHub. So, so that's one of the features. So I can build uh, for Mac. Uh, but the other feature is that I can have one step in my, my GitHub action can run to up to six hours, <laughs> which means I can build Chromium. And uh, now if you've never done this before, uh, you would probably not realize how long it takes to build Chromium. It really depends on your hardware. The hardware in GitHub Actions for Linux and Windows is not great. So six hours is actually usually not enough. Sometimes it is. It depends. You have to get lucky. Uh, for Windows, it's not enough at all. Like you don't have enough disk even. So, so Windows is off the table. Linux, sometimes. Um, but for Mac, you can do both a, a, a full Qt build with Qt Web Engine. Um, in, in well under six hours, usually, both for debug and release. So, but we have uh, an issue. I don't want to do a six hour build every time somebody pushes to GitHub. That's going to suck big time. Uh, so what I tried, and I'll give you, I'll show you here. So let's see here. So this is this is what it looks like the the YAML file that is on uh, GitHub. This is the one that is like the the regular one that runs uh, whenever uh, somebody checks in. Let's see here. Uh, so it's called CI release. Uh, so if you push uh, on master, if you have a pull request on master, then it will uh, this thing will run. Uh, it will run on these uh, different platforms. So, so for example, here is Mac OS. Uh, but we don't want to build uh, Chromium every time, right? So for a similar problem, uh, GitHub has this thing they call um, the GitHub Action Cache. And this is basically meant for things like node modules and things like that. Um, uh, the bad thing about this, well, the good thing about it is it's free. So you can just add it in and it will like cache things. And, and in Conan will cache things in what is called the dot Conan um, folder. The unfortunate thing is that whenever you start up your GitHub action, you're starting from scratch. So you need to like get a dot Conan folder from somewhere to have this cache. Now, if you had money and this budget, I have no money, remember? Um, then you could probably use like an artifactory and all sorts of things for these things. And probably in the end, I will. Uh, but currently, no budget. So we're going to try to do this as cheaply as possible. But the, unfortunately, the GitHub cache is quite slow. And sometimes it doesn't work, uh, which means you suddenly have a build that takes six hours. So I made um, this. So it's, it's, it's a GitHub action uh, that I made that basically takes the .conan folder and checks it into Git and pushes it to GitHub. <laughs> so so it is. it never fails. It's, it's extremely stable. I'm very happy with it, but it's a big hack. Um, 
So that's called Conan Cash. If this is the thing that you need, uh, then then there is an action for you. Uh, it's a total hack because I'm totally abusing uh, GitHub uh, for my cache, where I just basically check in everything and push it to GitHub. Um, yeah, so I stop my .conan into Git, and then I push it to GitHub. It's great. Uh, for big files, and I do get some really big files, especially uh, the, the the library for for uh, for for the cute web engine. Uh, then I use GitHub LFS, which you can get uh, some of it for free, and then you have to pay if you use more. Um, for testing, I haven't gotten that far yet. Not much. I I, I need to, to test QML. I need to test C and I might also want to have some kind of driver to be to have some automated testing. Um, so far, I haven't gotten that far. So we'll skip over that. So for licensing, this was my first like big real feature after like just getting tabs. Uh, because if you're basing yourself on open source, uh, you you have to to comply with the licenses. Open source people think like, oh no, I'm gonna get all of this stuff for free. Uh, but open source is a legal contract. And so you have to actually comply to that legal contract. Um, and there are basically two uh, major components that is going to dictate my licensing. So Chromium is is uh, comes out of Google. Google are they are very um, conservative about licensing, so they they use very they use very open licensing. So usually th there won't be a problem pulling in things uh, from Chromium because they're pretty safe. Qt is maneuverable, but it is a little bit difficult because Qt has been working more and more to try to push people over to commercial licenses, but we have no money. So we have to go with the open source licenses and it's going to be a little bit more tricky. Um, so, so the idea here is that we're going to use Conan to, to collect the licenses from all of our dependencies. Um, and, oh, there we go. Um, and we're doing that here. So basically, this is this is to ask uh, Conan to go and uh, try to pick up all of the license files from all over the place and put them in a folder for us. So we do that. Uh, then we make a QRC. So we have a little bit of a script and some stuff in in a GitHub action actually. Um, it's here runs once a week. Here. So this this here will will do this uh, pulling in the licenses, then clean up uh, some of that stuff, and make this QRC file. Uh, so if we go and we look at the QRC file, it basically looks like this. So QRC is a way in Q to just uh, stuff everything into the binary. Um, so it just embeds all sorts of resources. In this case, it embeds a bunch of of uh, license files. So now we have we're, we're taking all of the license files and we're embedding it inside of our binary uh, but this can be explored uh, in code uh, as as if it was any kind of file structure so then we can uh, use uh, Qt to display it so if we go back to our wonderful browser um, then we have our like one and only uh, UI feature here uh, currently. So this will then be like a tree view here. You can open things and look at them. Uh, there's also some search uh, functionality. So let's like, you can search for things. Um, happy, no, nothing is happy in here. Um, nice. There you go. Nice try. If, actually, if you have like an open source project, it might be fun to just go see like what kind of things uh, are inside of Chromium that is like you might have actual code inside of Chromium. Uh, because the dev tools uh, in Chromium do pull in uh, a bunch of known modules. So if you have like a JavaScript library out there, you might actually have some code inside of Chrome. Um, OK, so that is the GUI to display it. And, and this is to try to be uh, compliant in the displaying of the license. But one of the other things that I need to make sure of uh, uh, is to try to, be to, to monitor this, because now I'm pulling in 
my dependencies automatically, I need to make sure that I am complying uh, with the licenses and I don't pull in something that I'm in violation of that I need to remove. Okay, so if we look at what is it that we need for our, our like, a minimal viable uh, product or a minimal valuable product. Like we need to make some kind of browser that would be useful uh, for someone that somebody would actually bother to use. Uh, so we need a web view, of course, because we need to display the internet. Uh, we need tabs because it's 2020 and who doesn't have tabs? Uh, we need some shortcuts uh, because if not, I'm gonna go crazy. Um, and we need like windows, like you have to be able to open multiple windows uh, we need to be able to build and test. Uh, and then we need to have some way of updating the web view to new versions. And this is in quotation marks here, because in this case, it's basically just uh, fetching uh, a new version of Conan Qt and building it basically in this uh, first MVP. So this MVP is not, is not meant to release to people, but it is something that you, know, you can work with. Um, and then packaging. Uh, packaging becomes uh, important because we need some way to oh, uh, package uh, up our binary for the three different platforms that we're going to support. So the Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. Um, this bit is not really finished. I've started doing some of this. Um, here, uh, so I, I do have some, uh, some um, code here. So this is using CPAC, which I'm hopeful is going to be the way to go uh, for generating packages and also installers. Uh, apparently, I should be able to use uh, 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 Qt uh, has an installer project as well. And together with CPAC, I'm hoping to be able to generate like an MSI installer for Windows. But I haven't gotten very far. There's like some stuff here. Um, and then, of course, like the licenses, which is super important uh, to get all of my legal stuff in order. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to go through this like super fast. Um, hopefully things didn't crash. Oh, there we go. Um, so CPAC is what I'm going to be trying to using for both packaging and, and installers. Uh, together with uh, some cute uh, functionality for that. And hopefully that will uh, tie it up pretty well. So but if I end up having like proper uh, packages, then I will make basically a green button on the website to like download browser. Uh, and that's going to be basically using GitHub releases and, and pushing the releases there. And then the, the button will download them from GitHub. So basically, I have no infrastructure on my side. I'm using GitHub as like a free cloud infrastructure for me. Um, OK, so for the website, well, OK, there's like basically nothing there right now. Uh, but the idea is uh, that it's going to be GitHub pages because I don't have time. So I need like some kind of like Jekyll theme and just a green, big green download button and that's all. And that also means that I'm not doing any real hosting. It's also hosted on GitHub. So this is basically like how to bring up like a browser using GitHub for everything. <laughs> so the releases, yeah, well, the plan is that, uh, you know, to keep it simple and uh, I will probably be using GitHub releases. Um, and, and that's it basically. But, uh, for the web itself, like you have now, like imagine that you have, uh, you know, you have your embedded web view that has actual requirements for UI, uh, you know, and, and some of the, some of it is quite um, obvious. Uh, you need some way to, to display information about certificates like, or, or, you know, the lock or not lock or these kinds of warnings in the URL bar. Um, you probably uh, want to have some way to show like I'm loading this website uh, currently, which you need to show like the load status and things like that. Um, you need some kind of menu if people like right click on your on your website uh, to to do stuff and that needs functionality like open in background page or things like that. 
or copy link, uh, you need tab cycling. And this is probably like <laughs> to be like the first thing I make of these things because I totally need tab cycling. If you don't use tab cycling, um, then you probably won't notice. But if you do, it's going to drive you nuts that it doesn't exist. Then you have the concept of autocomplete. I'm not really sure how much you need of that today because people like write something in the URL bar and press enter and then it goes to Google. And uh, I'm not sure how much people use autocomplete, but we'll see. Find in page is absolutely imperative to me. I can't use a web browser where I can't search in a page. Um, and then you have things like notifications uh, that might be necessary. And also I like uh, requesting access for, for the camera or the microphone and things like that. Uh, and that is under like dialogues, like things like uh, upload file is also a dialogue. Like all of these things you need, uh, somebody does something in a web page and you have to actually present something uh, UI wise. So, but if you want to go past this, right, and you want to go to like an alpha release, what is it that you need for your alpha release? Well, you need to actually update the web view. And we're going to get a little bit back to what that means in a little bit. Uh, you need translations. Um, and I do have like the beginning of translations. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see here. So if you look down here, I have these uh, license files. Now these are our are, are, are cute translation, uh, not license files, language files. So these are, are, are generated. I also have um, a job on GitHub that goes through and, and generates uh, language files once a week uh, because there's uh, this cron job, cron job thing up here that uh, runs on, I guess it's Tuesdays. Um, that will go and collect all of the strings around inside of Qt. And this is built into Qt, so I'm just using Qt here. Uh, currently, I don't have any translations. I just create the files. Uh, we need some kind of way to, do, to to style the UI because right now it's like it's not really pretty. Um, if you look here, it has like these um, very square kind of tabs, um, and there is a system for that. So we'll look at that also a little bit. Accessibility, I, I'm hoping I can use a lot of what is built into to, uh, uh, to Qt. Uh, also, uh, for shortcuts as well, uh, we need uh, custom shortcuts. We need sessions so that you don't close all the tabs when you close the browser. Uh, DevTools is quite is also built into to Qt. So they, it should be quite simple to get in, uh, quite simple. Um, asterisks, right, uh, to get that in, uh, hopefully, uh, quickly. But then you also have to have some kind of download management. And this is a, like, I, I, it could be a killer feature for a browser to be able to handle downloads really well. Um, so for the styling, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm planning on using the Qt Imagine style. So Qt has a bunch of built-in styles. Um, that you can use, and you can do some kind of uh, very simple tweaking of them through this file, uh, Qt Quick Controls 2 Conf. Um, and then you can you can set like uh, different kinds of fonts and colors and things like that for the different ones. Uh, and then you can also set what is uh, what is your style, like the one that you want, and also what is your fallback style. And it will use this to, to style uh, your UI. So currently I'm using the default style, and then here under this header you will find uh, stuff that will um, tweak the look and feel of of that. But in addition to this, uh, Qt has this Qt Imagine style, which is based more on on uh, on picture assets, uh, and we need something like that to be able to make uh, prettier tabs, like with rounded corners and things like that, to make it a more professional looking browser. So. I haven't gotten that far yet, so currently I'm using the default style, but the plan is to use Imagine style, and then I probably need like someone who actually has like a artistic side, which is not me, um, unfortunately. Okay, so what are the hard parts? Yeah, so the hard part is going to be updating Chromium uh, by far, like really updating Chromium. So to explain this, this is uh, 
So I have a couple of slides to explain why this is hard. Uh, so this here was, uh, I'm, I'm, the, the crosses just means don't worry about those releases. But, but in 2019, uh, Chromium had a bunch of releases. Now these are, um, they have a number, right? Um, so Chromium had a bunch of releases. One uh, was in uh, the spring, summer, which is 77. And then towards uh, Christmas, you have uh, Chromium 80. So imagine that, you know, you start the year at the, at the left center side, and then you kind of go around. Um, so, so those two releases are important in this case. Um, so the thing is, at the start of 2020, uh, Qt picked uh, the, the 77 version of Chromium to be Qt Web Engine. Uh, this was already half a year old. Like it was already six months old by the time uh, Qt 5.14 went out. It, had, it was already using about a six month old engine. Uh, Qt uh, 5.15 picked uh, Chromium 80, which was also when Qt 5.15 was released, almost six months old, right? The thing is that Qt 5.14 lasts for close to six months. And so by the time a new Qt version is released, the Chromium version that is embedded into Qt is almost a year old. Now this has a lot of, uh, of, of implications uh, if you want to make a real browser is that uh, it has security implications. Now Qt are, are saying that, you know, they are going to provide patches and blah, blah, blah for security issues. But we are looking at something that might be almost a year old. Uh, but now also it's unclear if they're going to continue to give patches to open source. Maybe it's only going to be for paying customers and then we're screwed. But also the fact that it is almost a year old, it, it means that you are not really making a browser anymore. Um, so if you want to make a real browser, you have to follow the Chromium releases. Uh, it, otherwise it's not for real. And if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it for real. Uh, so we're not going to be following cute releases for, 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 um, for Chromium. And this is going to be a problem. It's going to probably be the biggest problem I have to solve in like the first year. Um, because we're not going to play a browser, right? If we're going to do it, we're going to do it for real. Um, so this is how it sort of has to be. We have to kind of ignore the actual release that comes with Qt. Uh, and we have to, to pick up the real Chromium releases uh, and, and, and use those instead. Now, this is going to be a hassle, uh, most likely. Uh, because you have to do the integration work yourself. And there it will probably be integration work. There will always be integration work for every single release. And as you can see, there are a bunch of releases throughout a year. So this is this is uh, this is 2020 for Chromium. And uh, you know, now we are in the like 86, 87 stage. There are a lot of Chromium releases throughout a year, and this means that your browser has to have uh, as many releases as this. Um, so, so, you know, a month or so ago, Vivaldi and Chrome, they were over there in like 84, 85. Now we're probably in like the 85, 86, 87 stage. Um, so you have to keep on following the Chromium releases and this is going to be, um, uh, an issue. Also, the, the problem is a sandboxing because Chromium does uh, do a proper sandboxing on Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, but Qt has has turned off some of this. So this is a problem because there's, this is fully platform-specific code for sandboxing of the browser or, or the renderer process, the one that renders the web page. And, uh, and Qt has disabled it, at least on Windows, part, parts of it at least. And so now I have to like dig into this and try to figure out how to make sure that we are properly sandboxed on all platforms. And the process architecture in Qt is different than the, the normal process architecture in, in Chromium. And so that also has to be investigated. Uh, in addition to that, another complicating matter is proprietary media codecs. Um, because there's a bunch of codec patterns uh, which makes uh, makes uh, displaying 
uh, media like video and sound uh, or yeah, rendering uh, media hard. And these codec patterns, a lot of the big companies like you know Google and and uh, and Apple and and Microsoft, they are in these pattern pools, and so they don't have to deal have to worry about it. But for for small <laughs> custom small browsers, niche artisanal browsers, uh, this is a big issue. So the good thing is a lot of the free codecs they are inside of FFmpeg and FFmpeg is embedded in, or is is inside of Chromium like 50,000 other open source projects which are also inside of there and it will handle all of your your non proprietary uh, media codecs but a lot of stuff is not covered by that and and like simple stuff like gifs on Twitter that won't play if you don't have like H.264 codec and that is not free. So I've been thinking maybe I could use uh, Qt Multimedia for this or something. We'll see what I can uh, make. I want to make something that will work cross-platform and sort of reliably uh, using uh, the the uh, the platform libraries that you have on your machine. And these can then um, use, uh, use uh, codecs that are legal. Uh, that come with Windows or or with Mac OS or with uh, with non-free FFmpeg plugins. So when we get to this, we're going like, okay, so what is the next step? What right? is the the beta release? And here it says uh, we've updated our privacy policy. And the reason for that is that up until now, I have no infrastructure, right? I have a, a CI/CD pipeline and a release pipeline and a web page, and all of that is running on on GitHub. Uh, uh, when we build the application and you download it, it's running on your machine, but there's actually no back end. There is no server. This is just an application that you download and you run on your machine that will render the internet, right? Um, but when we come to a better release, we're sort of getting to features that require to have a back end. Uh, for example, crash reporting. Like, if you want to have a stable product, you have to have uh, a way to to release uh, cra or to receive crash reports. Uh, you need uh, printing. So this this is not a server thing, but you need to be able to print. <laughs> this is not a, a you know a huge feature, but you kind of need to do it. Uh, you probably want to support like Chrome um, extensions, and that you have to figure out. You have things like history, uh, bookmarks. Uh, what should a new page look like? Like currently, if you do like Control T, it opens Google. I mean, you probably want some kind of UI there, something you know. Maybe you can set a picture. Um, you may might want to have some panels or some other things. But one of the big things you want is some way to update this, uh, and this is going to have to be integrated into how uh, things are done on the different platforms. So this is going to be interesting. Um, for the crash reporting, I'm going to try to use Sentry. Uh, Sentry has uh, some cute uh, integration, which I'm hoping is going to help on the client side. Uh, but the idea here is that we have some server that will do deduplication of crashes, uh, will will create uh, nice stack traces, and hopefully, like create like an issue report uh, when when a crash is reported. Um, and then all of the browsers will submit crash reports uh, to that uh, from the different platforms. And then, of course, Patricia goes like, OK, but if you're going to make a browser, you have to make it on mobile as well. And I haven't even really started with that. But what I'm planning on doing, hopefully, is to use a, a cute web view. Um, so Qt WebView is basically just a wrapper around the platform web view. So that means I'll be using the platform web view on both Android and and uh, iOS, and I, I really don't have much of a choice on iOS because it's the only thing that's accepted. And on Android, um, Qt Web Engine, it doesn't support Android yet, although Chromium does, so that's an issue. So I, I will need an Android build, an iOS build. I need some kind of like just basic integration, right? Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I can't even think about that right now, but something, mobile, yes should do that. Um, so so I went back to this now in August and now in September. And 
you know, things are moving forward, but we're still in pandemic times and um, it's it's hard to plan for the future. What are you going to do uh, when you don't really know what the situation is going to be in just a few months, right? So one thing that we can learn from all of this is that making a browser is not a one person job. Uh, just to keep part, like up with Chromium releases is going to probably be a full time slash part time job. But you can get surprisingly far with just one person uh, and little or no money. Uh, but the thing is, and this brings us back to the thing that we always know, known, right? That we need a way to pay for open source uh, because we can't have people doing all like important work in their free time. Uh, and then it's like, okay, yeah, you can have a GitHub sponsor or patron and, you know, maybe I'll get a GitHub sponsor page. Like I kind of partially started, uh, but I don't know if that is a, a, like a sustainable way to do this. So if you have zero budget and one dev and a lot of open source, you can kind of make a browser. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much.